Hello. Time to time to get started. Hi. Uh, um, not really Shannon. Uh, my name is Jen Zhong Chi. Um, you, you might have seen me in the first lecture if you actually come to our first lecture. Um, I teach the subject together with Shannon um, in, this, in this semester. He's going to be away for two weeks. He's actually going to a conference presenting a teaching development project that we did together last year to improve this subject. So we are pre presenting what we did last year uh, at the moment while well, uh, Shannon is in, in Portland, I believe. So while he's away, I'll be trying to be as like him as much and then help you get through these two uh, weeks. Um, to be honest, Shannon has this unique style. It would be very difficult to really mimic them. Uh, I'll try my best. The chance is that I wouldn't be as interesting as him in, the, in my lectures, unfortunately. But I'll try to at least be as informative as he is. Okay? So for these two weeks, we are going to uh, basically talk about arrays, continue to discuss arrays and algorithms, algorithm analysis. So last week, I believe Shannon has introduced, in, introduced the class into arrays and a little bit of uh, algorithms, linear search, binary search. Now in today's lectures, we are going to actually look at the code. How do we implement those um, algorithms? How do we use arrays to implement those algorithms? And how do we do a bit of analysis over this al those algorithms? How do we show why binary search is actually better than linear search? We know binary search is faster, right? Um, I wish I can throw, tear out the, the telephone board and throw it away. That's actually my trick before, because Shannon coming to the lectures. But now he got that. Um, and I'll just talk about the code, all right? OK, so just a quick, really quick flashback. Uh, I'm going to use this uh, set of slides, which uh, might look a bit different from what Shannon used. Uh, he developed, developed his own set of slides. And this is more like a set of slides that more or less come with the textbook. Um, and actually, the topics being covered for these two weeks is largely chapter 7 and a little bit about chapter 12, if you are wondering, if you are reading the textbook. So that might help you read this one a bit. And if you want, want to know where this set of lecture slides is, um, if you ju just go to our algorithms of fun, uh, algorithms of fun site, um, and go to week four, you got this set of slides. Um, similarly, if you go to Add discussion forum. If you click on this download button in here, you got a full set of all the slides that we are going to use for the semester. Uh, Shannon slides will, will be released progressively. The set of slides that come with the textbook is already all we have all, all put them online already. So enough about the logistics, arrays and algorithms. First, we are, we're going to do a quick flashback. Um, arrays. We say arrays is just a, a type of variable or a type of structure, if you want that help us to store a large set of items. And importantly, this set of items, they must be of the same type. You can't have an array of students, and then cars, and then bank accounts. That doesn't work. It has to be an array of integers, array of doubles, array of bank accounts, array of cars, array of students. That's all fine. But they, whatever you want to put in an array, they must be of the same type. Why? The reason for that is when you declare an array, you only got one chance to declare what's inside of the array. For example, you can do int array A, and then you can declare a size of the array, the number of items you want to put in the array. So that's just one chance to specify what's the type. And because of that, you can only got one type of stuff in, inside of the array. Right? That's array. And you I already don't know that. Um, further, you also know that arrays is just a language sugar to ease the use of pointers. So then our first example in today's class would be actually how do we use arrays as pointers or pointers as arrays. So just to sort of do a bit of a quick flashback. I'm going to dem demonstrate the process with, with an online sort of code execution site. This site offers an animation of the running of a, a piece of code step by step. Um, So here we we'll give an example. Um, this is an example. The first half of it, you obviously see, um, I'm pretty sure you've already seen it. Uh, we create an array, and we fill in uh, some values to this array elements. Actually, you guys at the back, can you see the, the projected screen? Very good. Uh, so 
The first of half of it is just create an array and put some item into the, put some values into the items of the array. Nothing magical yet. The, the interesting bit is actually the second half. But just for completeness, um, there's one more thing I want to mention. Um, here, when we create an array, as we said, we, we give a type to the array, uh, array name, a type of the array, and the number of items we want to put into the array. Here, we, we set it as n, and n here is a 5. Because uh, obviously, we can also put just a number 5. That will work just as well. But in, instead, we, we sort of define a constant. This is a general considered as a good programming uh, practice. If you want to create a constant value in your program, typically, at the top of the program, we define a constant and give a name to, to that value. And this is for readability purpose and for maintainability purpose. Because later on, if you don't want an array with five elements anymore, you want an array of 125 elements. You quickly just change this n to 125, rather than just going through the whole program and making sure that every five has been changed to 125. That's, that's the purpose. Uh, obviously, in Shannon's example, we have used a variable to create, uh, create an array. Basically, what he did is like set a length and then let the length be five, and then you, you got an int a length. That will serve the same purpose. Uh, in the older version of C language, uh, that is actually not allowed, but modern C standard allows that. It gives you a bit more flexibility. So that's that. Uh, let's not worry about too much about that, and let's just go straight to the pointer stuff. We say arrays are essentially just pointers, and for that purpose, we can actually give an array to a pointer. So here is the way we, we declare a pointer, right? When you want to create a pointer, we say int, and then we put a star in front of the pointer variable that we want to create. So we got an integer pointer type. And for an array, it's also an integer type pointer. And because of that, we can actually give that pointer value of the array to an actually properly defined pointer variable. And that's what we did in here. And what, would, what we would do after that is actually print out the value of A and value of P. What does it mean by the value of A and value of P? A is an array. What's the value of A? Yes, len? I think the, the address of the like, index zero. Yeah, the address of the index zero, the first element of the array. Because if we say arrays are essentially just a pointer, so the array variable, if you think about it, it's just a variable that stores the starting memory address of the first element. So that's how we actually get hold of an array. If you think about it, when you access an array, you tell the system, I want to access the array, right? In order to access that array, what do we need to know? Obviously, it's address. And that's the reason why array variable, actually, you can logically think of it as the array variable stores the memory address of the array. In actual uh, implementation, uh, array variable is not really a variable. It's just a name alias of the memory address. That's the actual uh, implementation. But anyway, let's see um, what, what will happen if we run this piece of code. So I'm clicking on this next button, which every time I click it, the, the piece of code will got uh, run for one statement. And as you can see, um, the red arrow here points to the next statement to be executed, uh, which means we have already executed the variable declaration part. And the variable declaration part creates an array, a pointer variable, and an int. Um, Actually, can you see the text here? Like it says pointer to int at the back, boys, girls. You can see uh, pointer to int, right? You can see that. So we got three variables: a array a, as as you can see, it's actually a sequence of storage boxes that can be used to store five elements. So we say the array stores five elements, and then there's a pointer. Uh, it's a, there's a question mark in here, meaning that the pointer variable hasn't got anything there yet. And also, there's an i variable, which we, we're going to use it to loop through the uh, the, the array. This is looping variable. So if we keep running this one, um, we, it will just start the first iteration. And uh, after running the first iteration, A0 got a value. And A0 apparently, uh, based on this calculation, 0 times 0 plus 1 divided by 2, you got 0. Um, similarly, if you continue to run it, uh, we'll just uh, go through the next iterations and next and next and next. And you will complete all these iterations and fill up this array A. So far, so good. This is where we, we were at from last week, and now it's this week, OK? Uh, let's see. Um, we promise you that when we print out A, it will give you the memory address of the array. Uh, let's see what we got. Indeed, it prints out a 0x blah, blah, blah. This is a memory address in has a decimal form. 
has a decimal, it's a num numbering system based 16. The usual number system that we use is decimal, it's base 10. We, we also expo expose you to binary representation, which is base 2. Um, this 0x ff uh, something means base 16. Uh, the reason why it has to have an f is because, well, we can count from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, but once we move on to 10, it has to be two digits. However, because it is a base 16 system, every digit needs to be able to represent from 0 up to 15. It's just like for a base 10 system decimal, every digit represents from 0 to 9. Once we move on to two digits, we are talking about 10. It's not single digit anymore. It's two digit, right? So similarly, here we need to have a number that represents from 10, 11, 12, 13, count up to 15. And that representation we use A, B, C, D, E, F. So that's how, how this F comes. And because the uh, memory address could be a super large number, because we talk about 8 gigabyte memory or, or 16, now uh, 80 gigabyte memory. So a giga is 1 billion, roughly, talk, uh, rough, roughly speaking. And if you want to write some 1 billion in here, it's going to be super long address number. So we shrink it a bit and use a base 16 system to uh, make it a bit easier to read. And that's the typical uh, approach to show um, memory addresses. And to show that, we use percent %p to print out the memory address. All right? So A got this memory address. And now we assign uh, A to P, and let's see what will happen. Now, P gets a value. Now, theoretically, you would say P here should store a value, which is this 0xffff000bc0. And that's true. For animation purpose, this website shows a pointer variable with an arrow that points to the starting memory address of this array A. That's the reason why we call it a pointer. It points to something. Um, now, we can simulate print out uh, the, the value at P. And as you can see, P and A actually has, have the exact same value, meaning that now P is actually storing the memory address of A, and whatever you want to modify on A, you can do that through P. Because remember that demonstration using that uh, two, two mailboxes, you open one uh, mailbox, get the memory address of the other uh, mailbox, and then you change its value. Here's what's happening, all right? Now, once we, we got that, now P and A are both pointing to the same memory address, and we can use, to, use them both to do the same operation on the elements inside A. And here's a demonstration. We are not really modifying anything yet. This is just to show, so to show that using pointer P, we can also access every element in A. And what we're doing here is just another loop that goes through every element. And um, this, ex this way of writing A plus I, and then put a star in front of it, this is exactly the same as A square root, uh, square, square bracket I. So again, this is A square bracket I is just a language sugar of saying star A plus I. Make sense? Um, and because we say P and A are just the same, so whatever you can do with A, we can do that with P. So star P plus I basically just means, all right, you know P points to the first element, but what's the ith element after that? then apparently it's the ith element in the array. And let's get its value, the, de the referencing dense. This is what, what this star is doing. Right? So give you the ith element in the array. Now, if we, we, if we don't have this star in front, then that means we, are, we just want to get the memory address of the ith element in the array. That's what's going on. And i here is just the <coughs> looping variable. Let's see what, what do we get if we run this bit. Um, it's a bit cumbersome, but we can still observe this. Um, let's just press a few times, and then we come back to observe it. As you can see, um, whenever this print state, uh, printf statement got executed, it print out i, and at the moment, when i is zero, meaning the first iteration, p plus i hasn't really changed yet, so it's still p. And this is the first element, which has a value of zero, and this is also the first element, which has a value of zero in here. Now, let's look at the next iteration. So I've actually executed a few more iterations um, so, so that we don't have to go back and forth. Now, there are a few more iterations. And as you can see, in the next iteration, i 
got increased by one, we move on to the next element. The interesting bit to observe in here, I hope you can see this one, is that when you move on to the next element, the memory address got increased by four. Why four? Yes? Yes, that's so many bits in an int. How many bits? Four. Bits or byte? A bit. Bit? Byte? Uh, byte. byte. <laughs> byte. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Tom tomato, tomato. <laughs> it's actually four bytes. Uh, every byte is eight bit, and for an int, it's 32 bit. So we got four bytes. And every byte counts as one unit in the memory address space. So. Um, Every time we increase by one, we actually move on to the next element in the array. And the next ele element in the array occupies for one, uh, four bytes. That's the reason why the memory just got, got increased by four. And this is actually another reason uh, why even when we're creating pointer variables, we also need to tell them what's the type of the pointer. In theory, every pointer variable is used to store a memory address. A memory address is just an int, right? So they are all just an int. Why do we have to give a type to a pointer? For example, if we got a double array or a double variable and we got a pointer point to it, we always say double star p, right? We don't just use in star p. So why do we have to give that a, a type as well? You want to try that? Well, because uh, different uh, variable types have different lengths of bytes. Yeah, very good. This is the reason such that whenever you, you don't want to jump, you know how much to skip in number of bytes. And also, in, when you want to reference a, a memory address, you know how many bytes of the value you, you would collect those bits and translate that to either an int or a double or a character. That's the reason, right? So that's what's happening. And you can actually properly uh, point to the next value in the array, which is one. And also, using star a plus i, we also got this, this second value, right? So far, so good. So without boring you too much, I'll, I'll just try to skip the whole thing, and I'll just jump through for, straight forward to the next loop. And by doing this, um, I basically set like what we call a breakpoint, and it will keep running the program until it hits a breakpoint. So, so the whole loop, loop in here got skipped, and we print out the whole thing uh, from the first element up to the fifth element. Uh, now, that's one way to do it. If you do this, there's really not much difference whether using pointer or using array. The next way will look a bit more different though, because uh, the next way to access array elements using a pointer, get rid of the looping variable i. Here, we are just using a pointer variable to loop through every element in the array. How can we do that? Well, we can do that because we know at the, begin, at the beginning, p has the memory edge of the first element in the array. Now, we can incrementally update this pointer variable such that each time it points to the next element, next element, next element, next element, until it points to the last element in the array. How do we do that? To do that, we need to do this plus plus operation. Basically, we increase the pointer var variable's value by one. And again, every time when you increase that value by one, you are actually increasing the value by four. Why four? Because it's one times the size of an int. So that's four. Let's see what will happen. So I'm, I'm running this bit now, and I'm going to print out uh, the p value and start p. And again, I'm going to just run it for a few times, and then we come back to observe it. As, as you can see, now I've actually run it for three iterations. First iteration, p is still pointing to the start, starting point of the array, because I haven't really changed it yet. Second iteration, p got increased by one, which actually changed this memory address value by four. And we point to the next element, and then the next element, and we got the next element's value. So that's how we, we can use uh, the pointer variable to access array elements in a second way. We actually use this p++ operator to go to the next one, next one, and next one. Right? Now the interesting bit though, once we finish the for loop, we know this pointer variable should still be pointing to somewhere. So when we finish the follow, where does this pointer variable point to? Inside of a for loop, we know the pointer variable keeps pointing to the next element, next element, next element, next element. But what happens outside of the for loop? Third 
Yeah, very good. Sec4 is also right, but only, that will only be triggered when we actually try to dereference it. If we don't dereference it, you can point to anywhere. As long as you, you don't try to actually access that place, you can point to anywhere. Nobody cares about it. Operating system doesn't care. Only when you actually try to access that place, operating system becomes super alert. No, 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 you shouldn't do that. Right. And, and also, you're right as well. When the for loop is done, the pointer variable will point to the element right after the last element in this array. So let's actually try to observe that. And indeed, it points to the element right after this one, and it, it shows a skeleton, means that you shouldn't really do that. It's dangerous. Don't do that. Uh, now, but no matter what, we can print out that value, because we are just pointing out a memory address value. That's all fine as long as we don't try to access actually in that memory address what's in there, because that doesn't really belong to this variable yet. And we can do that. And as you can see, still we are just going for increasing the memory address by, by one, and actually by four. Um, now, here comes this another interesting bit. For these pointer variables, we can actually do this kind of uh, pointer arithmetics, and not just adding a value, adding one to a uh, value stored in a pointer variable. You can also do pointer variables subtraction. And if you do p minus a, so we know p's value is now this uh, long bit of a string, and a's value is this bit of string. And just uh, for simplicity, uh, a is this, oops, a is actually this value, right? This is the starting memory address of uh, array a. And this is the value of p. If you do a subtraction between them, what's the value you got? So going back to a sort of high school math, 4 minus 0 is 4. d minus c is 1, right? <laughs> uh, so 4 minus 0 is 4. Uh, d minus c is 1. And 1 here actually means 10. And this 10 is a, has a decimal 10, which means 16. So 16 plus 4, we are supposed to get 20. And let's see whether we, we got 20 or not when we, we print out this one. Actually, you got 5. Again, same logic. How do we go from 20 to 5? Divided by 4. Why 4? Because an int, right? Int is 4 bytes. So same logic. For all these pointer arithmetics, um, whatever you, you fit it into it, you have to factor in that type of the pointer. Is it int, is it double, is it char? And that factor will be sort of incorporated as a multiply in these calculations. So far so good. So that's arrays and pointers. Uh, and that's one thing done. Uh, so, don't go. Uh, so we, that's one, one item down, and enough of me talking. Now it's for you to actually do something. Now take out a piece of paper, or, or your laptop if you have that, and try to write a function that takes an array of, for example, an array of int, and see whether the elements inside of the array are sorted or not. Sorted meaning in order, you know, uh, like, uh, the other day when Shannon shows you all those cards, you want to sort them in, a, for example, increasing order. So now I'm giving you an array A that stores the value of that, all those playing cards. And you tell me, are they in order or not? In particular, we, we want to ask you whether they are in increasing order. All right? So do this bit of exercise. Uh, you, you got five minutes for this. To help you a little bit, I'll give you a skeleton of this function. So the function would look something like this, because in, in case you ha haven't got super familiar with how, how to put an array into a function call, this is how you do it. Uh, obviously, you know how to create a function. You have a function name. You have a return type. The in here, meaning whether this array is sorted or not, because we don't have a Boolean to say whether it's true or false. We will say if it's sorted, we say return 1. If it's not sorted, we return 0. And as usual, we don't want to uh, use this constant values directly, we want to define them. So we say 1 is sorted, 0 is not sorted. And to fit an array into a function call, um, we say, all right, let's create that array, put the array name, uh, array type, 
And here uh, we use a pair of square bracket to tell the system that this is an array, not just an integer variable. But we don't need to tell the system what's the size. And the reason for that, again, remember, arrays are just pointers. All that the system cares is just where is the start starting point of the, of the, the array. I don't care where it ends. So you, you don't need to put the size of the array here. The actual thing that gives you the size of the array is this, what we call a body variable, an integer variable that almost always comes with an integer, uh, almost always comes with an array and tells you how many elements are there in the array. So you, you've got an integer array that has n elements. Now tell me, is it sorted or not? Come on. Now you should look down and start typing. Five minutes. All right, time's up. Um, anyone care to share the solution st strategy? You need to share your code, just your strategy. Maybe someone there. Anyone on that side? You want to share your s solution strategy? No? So go through the whole thing and track every pair. If they are not in order, bad luck. If all of them are in order, the whole thing is in order. That's the strategy. How do we translate that into the code? We apparently would need to a, a piece of loop, right? Um, probably we will need a looping variable um, starting from first element um, to the end. So maybe I less than n. Or maybe less, than, um, or n minus one. It doesn't really matter that much, really. How do we compare an adjacent pair of elements? Apparently, we need an if statement, and we say array i, and the next element would be i plus one less than greater than. Less or greater? Right. Less than or equal to? They are still in order, right? We don't need to do anything. If not, bad luck, not sorted. Um, yeah? Can you Exactly. So swap that and early terminate. Yeah. Right. So very good, very good observation. We, we want to try our every best effort to squeeze that last bit of uh, efficiency in there. And that's actually the purpose of the subject, uh, talking about foundations and algorithms. And we're going to analyze how, how do we squeeze and how do we analyze and measure the um, sort of running time efficiency of uh, this different piece of code. Obviously, we are still missing a verbal declaration, and that's what we're going to do. So that's the exotic. Uh, and that pretty much concludes sort of the first major chunk of this lecture. And then next, we are going to start a new topic, which is to move on to arrays that are a bit more complex, what we call two-dimensional arrays. What does two-dimensional array mean? Now, uh, so far, we, we've talked about a sequence things, all layout linearly. But quite often, we want to represent tables, which are sort of multiple sequences or multiple rows, putting them all together. For example, talking about an, an Excel table, right? It's a, what we call a two-dimensional array. But how do we represent a two-dimensional array? We know an array is a sort of a, a, a sequence, a linear sequence. And uh, very naturally, in the long memory tape, um, here uh, I've sort of plotted a bit of a simulation of an uh, array, uh, I mean a memory. And the memory you can think of is a really long tape and cut it into pieces. Every piece is one byte. And of course, you can also uh, put a few bytes together to form, for example, an int or a double. Um, and every byte has a memory address. So that's what we call memory and um, 1D array. 
Now, how do we go beyond one dimensional, right? How do we represent a table? To represent a table, we can still use a one dimensional array. Well, we, we can still use a memory type, which is one dimensional. We just have to linearize that two dimensional array into a sort of a uh, one dimensional type. And to do that, what we do is uh, suppose we want to create an array uh, of two dimensions, then we will first store all the things from the first row. And after that, we start with the things from the second row. Now, to tell the system that we, this is a, a two-dimensional array, we, we put two bracket, uh, square brackets. And the first square bracket means how many rows are there. And second bracket means how many columns are there. So we're going to finish from the first row. And here, I'm, I'm assuming that there are nine items, uh, I mean 10 items in, in, a, in a row. And when that's done, we continue with the second row. And this, this concept. Uh, sort of extends, and then we can represent many different rows and many different columns. And going beyond, we can even do three-dimensional array, four-dimensional array, and all all that things we can do that. Right? That's um, two-dimensional array. Now, that's the idea of two-dimensional array. But how do we put that into a C code? Let's look at the next example that talks about two-dimensional arrays. In this second example, um, we create a two-dimensional row with two-dimensional array with this number of rows and this number of columns. Um, as we just mentioned, the first square bracket tells you how many rows are there, and the second one how many, tells you how many columns are there. Um, still an array name and still a type. This array name, again, is still just a memory address. And this memory address is the starting memory address of the whole long tape that, that stores the linearized two-dimensional table. Right? And conceptually, it's visualized in this way. Here we are creating a two-dimensional array with two rows and five columns. And so conceptually, it looks, looks like this. Um, many, of, many of these operations are very similar to uh, those when you modify, like when you uh, operate on one-dimensional arrays. But we just want to show you uh, sort of one more example to demonstrate exactly how does it work. For example, the first step we want to do is to go through this 2D array and give an initial value for every element in this 2D array. How do we do that? Well, apparently, for one D array, we use a loop, go through ele every element, give them an, a value. For a two D array, we also do a very similar stuff, except that now we have to have two loops. The first loop goes through every different row. The second loop, the inner loop, goes through every column inside of a, a, a row. So that's, that's what's going on in here. Now, from the same logic, we can use that to print out the values that, that we put in the array. And we can do calculations. Uh, but before we actually go to the calculations, let's just quickly run up to here to demonstrate, um, demonstrate the process of initializing the 2D array. So this is the initialization part. We got a looping variable, uh, looping variables i and j. i here keeps at the keeps at being zero, which means that we are still looking at the first row. And j here goes from zero up to the number of columns, which is five. So we fill up the first row in here. And then the inner loop finishes, going back to the outer loop, which uh, continue to initialize the second row and give, it, uh, give, give values to them. That's the process. And repeating the same loops, we can print out the elements in this uh, 2D array. And I'll just quickly. Uh, skip that. And as you can see, these two D arrays got printed out using this um, two layer nested loop. I think the first key message to take away with this two D array is just that you need two dimensional, uh, you, you need uh, two layer nested loops to go through the elements. Just like for one D array, one loop, two D array, two loops. Um, next is how we can pass a two D array into a function call. Because that's very, very important. Um, Typically, you don't put all the code in your main function. You almost always put the code into like separate chunks. Every chunk is like a function. So when you have a 2D array, how do you put it into a function call? And this is very similar to what we do for 1D arrays. To put a 2D array into a function call, similarly, we also give the only the array name into a function call. And once we got this array name into the function call, the, the 
process to write code inside the function is pretty much similar to that in the main function. Like here, we are just repeating the same process to print, print out this 2D array. We tell the system that we are now printing to, uh, creating a function that can print out a 2D array. Now, in this function call, just give the array name into the function call. Additionally, we need to tell the system how many rows are there in this array. This is tricky because remember, um, previously in the example when you say it's sorted uh, function, we need the array name, we need how many elements in this array. Now, if you put a 2D array into function call, you might you will imagine I need array name, I need how many rows are there, how many columns are there. But we don't. We just need how many rows are there. What's going on? Now, what's going on in here is that when you create a function that works on a 2D array, you actually have to tell how many columns are there in this array already in the function declaration. You don't need to tell how many rows are there, just like in the exotic function, you don't need to tell how many columns are there in this array. When you move on to a 2D array, you need the columns, but you don't need the rows anymore. Now, extending the same logic, if we have a 3D array, then, again, the first dimension, you don't need to tell what's the size, but the second and third dimension, you have to tell the size. But why? And we'll tell you why um, right now, basically here. So. The reason why we, we, we can do that is because here, inside of a function call, because we only have an array name in here, and using this array name, we can access elements of this array. We can still write like aij as before. We, we want to access the i row, the j's element. So we can access that. But the issue is, to access the i row, j's element, we have to calculate the memory address of the i uh, row, j's element. Previously, uh, for one D array, if you would just say AI, we know the memory address of that is A plus I times four. But with two D array, if you just a, say AIJ, you can't do A plus I plus J. That doesn't work, right? And we also cannot do A plus I times J. That doesn't work either. What we need to do is actually a plus i times the size of a row. How many rows we need to skip? And then plus j times of the size of the column. But how do we know what's the size of a row? In order to know what's the size of a row, we have to know how many columns are there in a row. That's the reason why when you put a 2D array into a function call, we ha it has to go with this column size. Column size. And similarly, if you have 3D, 4D, ND array, you have to know the size of the n minus 1Ds. Only the top dimension, you don't have to worry about that. That goes into the function call as a, in the form of a body variable. Make sense? Confused? Falling asleep? Um, doesn't really matter if you, 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 you got confused. Just trying to remember, if you put a 2D array, you have to also tell the system what's the number of columns in that array. It almost you can think of it as a, a rule if you, 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 you find it too difficult to, to really uh, compare what's really going on. Uh, so that's how you uh, access a 2D array. Now, yes? Yeah, I was just wondering, by, like, instead of having a second argument, which is the number of rows, could you do the same thing that you do with the columns and put that in the first pair of square brackets? Right. Good question. What if we just put these rows inside of here? That would make it so easy, right? That's, that's enough. We don't have to uh, go with a second uh, variable to tell you. I uh, always got, go with a um, uh, sort of a body variable. In theory, you can, but it's not so flexible. The reason for that is, even though when I create an array of 10 rows, I don't have to use it all up. What if I just want to use the first five rows? then it's dangerous, because if I go with rows, then I will assume that I can access all these 10 rows inside of my for loop. I won't stop until I hit the number of rows. But I only got values in the first, first five rows, and the second half of the array, 2D array, will have some random gibberish in there. And we won't get a right calculation if you want to do some sort of calculation. For example, if you want to calculate the mean or the sum of all the elements in the 2D array, then I'm looking at too many values. That's the reason why we use a body variable to control um, how many rows you want to access in this 2D array. And for the same purpose, um, 
And you might wonder, well, you, you said that, but why, don't you, why, why can't you do the columns? You can do the columns, and if you don't have enough values in the columns, what you do is you also put another body variable to tell you how many columns are actually having values in there. We can make it even more stream. For every different row, I might have different number of elements in there. That's also called a rack array. What do we do about it then? If every row has a different number of values in, in, in the 2D array, how do we tell, the, tell, tell this function which part should we access and which not? Yeah, very good. So you, you now you have to have a body variable for every row. And you have so many body variables, you might want to create an array that holds all the body variables. And of course, you can also do this sentinel value trick, uh, sentinel value trick where for every row, the last element that is valid in that row, you put, for example, a negative one to tell that this is the end of the row. That's also what you can do as well. But anyway, uh, very, uh, very good question and observation. So that's how you access elements in this 2D array. Now, there's one more trick we can do. We can actually treat a 2D array as if it's a, a 1D array. So uh, or an array of um, 1D arrays. So this is what we are doing in here. Because um, we know a 2D array, ultimately, the array variable is just a memory address. So if we start from the memory address, and we just go next, 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 and next, until we hit number of rows times number of columns, then we also go through the whole 2D array. So this is the trick. Uh, we, can also, we can also treat this 2D array as if it's a 1D array, but except that this is a 1D array with number of rows times number of columns, this so many number of elements. That's a, the that's a trick. And, it's other, and in the function call, you don't need to tell the system this is a 2D array. You can just tell the system, let's pretend that this is 1D array. And similarly, you still have a, a body variable to tell, tell that how many elements are, are there in this uh, 1D array. Uh, I write it as n calls here. This actually means how many rows and columns together in this, uh, how many elements together are there in this 2D array. And we can go through every element and we can print them all out. And we can actually try this one. So uh, here we, we got this first function call that will print out this 2D array. There's um, one way to do it, to print out the whole thing. In between, there's another way, which is, well, let's in the main function, we use another loop to go through the rows. And inside the function call, we just go through every row. So there are three different ways to access a 2D array. One is to put the whole 2D array inside the function call. The second is put the whole 2D array, but let's think of it as a 1D array. And the third is, let's treat these multiple arrays of, the, let's treat these 2D arrays as multiple arrays of 1D array. And every time we only give one row into a function call. And all three ways will, will work just the same. Okay? Um, let's just run this one and let's see whether it prints out or not. It's actually now inside of this print1d function, I believe. Um, but because this piece of code is probably too long, um, the system is now refusing to actually execute this part of the code. But anyway, it's still printing out. And it's just, we, I just need to keep clicking and clicking and clicking. And as you can see, now this 2D array is printed, being printed out in the form of a 1D array. Right? Um, so that's 2D array. Um, before we go, we just have one last example of 2D array. Um, just not uh, super technical. We will just take a couple of minutes and, and get it done. So here we, we got another example of a 2D array, except that now we don't call it a 2D array or a double type array anymore. We give it a different name. In here, I give a 1D double type array. We call it a vector. Here, we give a 2D double tie array, we call it a matrix. Um, this is what we call the type depth mechanism in C, which allows you to give a, different give, a, give a different name for that type. And the purpose of this is to improve the readability of our code. 
if you write a piece of code like this, and you show it to a mathematician, it might be a bit more difficult to for them to understand what's really going on. But if you tell them you, you got a vector A, a vector B, for them it's really easy to understand. This is just a, a, a sequence of numbers, right? And similarly, if you tell them this is a matrix, SQ has means square matrix, then this is just a 2D array of the same number of rows and columns. So this improves the readability of a code. And, and to do that, we, we use this type def mechanism to create a name alias of a type. And because of this is a type, we always uh, attach the name of the type with underscore t to tell the system that this is a type, or uh, to, to tell other programmers this is type, a type. Otherwise, when you mix this vector with any other bit of code, it could also represent a ver variable called a vector. And that's not great. So we always use underscore t to tell that this is a vector type, and this vector type represents a double type array. And this square matrix type represents a vector type array. And vector is array, and an array of vector array is a 2D array, and it's a matrix. Now, we create this type in this way, but uh, for anything that we want to do to access the element in this 2D array, or 1D array in this vector or square matrix T, we just do that exactly the same as before when we do this 1D and 2D arrays. Like for vectors A and B, they, we know that they're just 1D arrays. To access the elements, we just say AI, BI. For this C, we know it's a 2D array. Then to access it, we need to use this uh, CIJ to access each of the element. So that, that's the reason why I, I said we, we can quickly finish this example. The, the later piece of this code um, it's pretty much the, exactly the same as the 2D array example which I just showed you. The main difference really is just this bit. We can create a name alias of a type and for the purpose of better readability and maintainability of the code. And not just to make it easier to read, later on, if I don't want a double type array anymore, if I want to change the piece of code to handle an integer type array, I can easily change this one to int and all done. And that's the, the beauty about using type def. If you don't have this type def, then you have to do a global replacement of every double to int. But that's tricky, because not every double type in your code might be representing this array. You might have a double that represents, a diff, diff, for example, represent the, the sum of that array, or the mean of that array. But if you represent a double to an int, and still represent the mean of an array, it not, may not be accurate, right? So, this is the purpose of using the type def. Any questions? Otherwise, we will take a uh, 10 minutes break and we'll come back at 2.50. Yes? Yeah? Why there's an error mark under int? Because later on, uh, we are not doing uh, int calculation anymore. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, the calculation later on here is uh, many of them are doubles. All right, so 10 minutes break. We start again at uh, time, uh, 2.50. All right, uh, let's start again. So uh, actually, in this example that we just talked about, I just want to do a very quick clarification. Technically, when you do this array i and array i plus 1, uh, when you do i less than n, there's actually one off by one error. When i hits n, i plus 1, well, when i hits n minus 1, i plus 1 is actually n, and then array n is actually out, outside the boundary. So technically, we should only go up to i less than n minus 1. Very good observation. One of you has pointed this out uh, during the break. And if you are wondering why I'm sort of breathing so much, that's because uh, I have to move my car in the middle of the break because the university car park is full, and then I only find a one hour on street parking, and then I have to move, get it moved. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's the array part. Um, we talk about arrays. Uh, arrays can be accessed by pointers. Arrays are, uh, can be sort of put together and form multi multiple dimensional arrays. And using pointers and arrays and their relationships, we can actually use pointers inside function to modify arrays. And that, that's actually the reason why when we pass an array into a function call, the changes that we make to the, to the arrays, they will persist after the function call. We see that the C language is a call by value language. 
I mean, we put a value inside the function call, you can change that value inside the function. But you cannot change anything outside of the function. Anything you change inside the function, they get lost, they get lost after, after the function call. So, but for arrays, you bypass this limitation. Because when you pass an array into a function call, even though it's still passing the, uh, a value, but that value is the memory address of the array. So through that memory address, we can change the actual content outside of the function. Now, that's arrays. And next, we're going to start a new topic, algorithms. Now we are actually going to analyze all those linear, linear search, binary search, and all those, and un understanding why they are correct and why they are efficient. So algorithms, what does it mean by algorithms? Algorithms, in the end, they are no more than a few steps that we follow to solve a problem. Perhaps we want to be a bit more precise. Algorithms are a systematic sequence of steps that can be followed by computers to solve a particular problem. That's algorithms. Even though the algorithm world is quite fancy, but it's just a procedure to solve problems. That's it. That's algorithms. Um, when we talk about programming, we talk about how to translate this kind of sequence of steps or these procedures into something that can be understood by the, by the computer through a language that can be understood by the computer, which in this case is C program language. There are many other program languages, Python, Java, for example. Right? Now, when we talk about algorithm design, um, there are two main things to be considered. First and foremost, the algorithms must be correct. We want an algorithm, a sequence of steps that can solve a problem that is to our purpose. For example, in the linear search example, if we always return the first element in the array and we only check it and see whether it's the, the item we want to check, then it's not really a correct algorithm. It's super fast. We only check one element every time, right? Fast, but not correct. And that's no good. So in reality, it's always correctness goes first. Once we got a correct solution, we want to make it faster, takes less memory, maybe sometimes uh, easy to parallelize. For example, for all those deep learning on AI algorithms, we want it to be completely super fast and can be uh, parallelized such that we can optimize them using GPU, which has many cores and many threads that can do this parallel computation. So that's that. Uh, in this subject, we're not going to touch on uh, parallel computation, but we're going to analyze the different efficiency of different uh, algorithm designs. And we talk about efficiency. Um, usually, we talk about how the efficient, how algorithms are, uh, uh, how efficient algorithms are with respect to the increase of the input size. Think about, again, the linear search example. If you have an algorithm that no matter how large of a search problem you are talking about, you always can return the answer with just one simple checking, then that's too good. It has nothing to do with the input size, particularly whenever you talk about a solution, it almost always has something to do with the input size. If you want to check whether a student has come to, come to the lecture theater today, you need to go to each of the students and ask them. Probably not uh, if you really know the whole class, but if you don't, then you have to do, go for one by one, right? And if you have a class of 10 students, or if you have a class of 10,000 students, that checking is entirely different. So we do this kind of correctness and uh, efficiency analysis using this simple example of searching. An example says, um, given an array of n elements uh, of some type, n elements, how do we determine whether an element is in inside of an array or not? And I won't repeat this linear al algorithm again, because you know already, right? Shen will show, you the, show this to you already. Uh, you basically go through each of the elements uh, one by one using a looping variable i and test um, whether you found the element or not. If you go, uh, keep going and keep going, and if none of them matches your, your target, then you hit beyond the boundary of the array, then we know, all right, no, we cannot find the element in the array. Otherwise, we say, yes, uh, good, um, the element is at the ice place. So now let's talk about two things, correctness and efficiency. Correctness first. How do you show that this algorithm is correct or not? And to show whether an algorithm is correct or not, we need to use the help of assertions. Uh, assertions are sort of argued statements 
that is always correct uh, or must be correct through the program execution. And through these assertions, if we assert every place, after every statement inside your program, your program is correct, then the whole thing we can argue that it's correct. So how do we assert? And when we say assert, we always assert certain conditions. So we have to inject some conditions in, in, your, in our program, and we assert those conditions are always hold true. And, and in particular, when we want to assert some conditions are true, we're talking about a special kind of structure, the loop structure, we need a special condition called the invariance, loop invariance, which is a condition that never change inside a loop. That's loop invariance. Now let's try to do this assert kind of analysis to ensure the correctness of a piece of code. In this uh, case, it's linear search. So how do we analyze it? Um, here, the piece of assert, uh, the, the linear search code, the code here, this is one called a pseudo code. This is pretty much just a, a repeat of that. Uh, this is pretty much just a repeat of this in so, uh, linear search piece of code. Now that we, we, we only break it into statements, and for every different statement, we insert an assertion to test whether a certain condition holds or not. And at the, in the end, we found that all the condition holds, and we say the whole thing is correct, right? So now, at the start, at the start, um, we only set a looping variable i to be zero to start the, the uh, looping to go through all the elements. So at the beginning, there's really not much has changed yet. We now need to define a condition that must be true. And at this point, we know that i must be within the boundary of the array you want to search. So i must be between zero and n. Obviously it's true, because i at the beginning is just zero, right? Zero must be greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to n. If this is not true, your input has some problem. It cannot be, right? And also, we haven't found this input element, uh, x, to be found yet. So because i here is at 0, 0 minus 1 is negative 1. And between 0 and negative 1, there's an empty set. Nothing can be inside of an empty, empty set. So this condition also be true, uh, must be true. So at the beginning, we know this condition must be true. So this is actually the, the status of the code when you reach this point. When you reach this point, i is within a certain range, and we haven't found x yet. Moving on, now when we go into a while loop, again, we insert an assert statement after every statement, basically. Now when we go inside a while loop, this previous condition that we found, we can, can be copied over, because we haven't really changed too much yet. So we copy that condition over. There's one more condition that we need to copy over, because we say, while it's a looping sort of mechanism that says, let's keep doing this when this condition is true, right? So inside of our loop, we know this condition must be true. So now we have a condition that is P plus this looping condition. Make sense? So we know at this statement, this whole thing must be true. And then we will move on to the next statement in the while loop. Interesting bit though, is that after this statement, the later part, may not be true anymore, because now we actually change the value of i. Previously, we say, at this statement, i must be less than n. But once you increase by 1, there's no guarantee i is still within n. So this later part is broken. We can't guarantee that anymore, so we throw it away, we only keep p. Continue the same analysis. After the while loop, we know this p condition must still be true. In the meantime, the reverse of this condition must be true. Otherwise, the while loop will not break. That's the idea. So we got this. So now it's good. Essentially, we are basically just saying that what is still true after every statement of the code. And in the end, if we, we got all this analysis, it's done, and we know um, in every statement, we only hit sort of the true condition, then we can guarantee that every statement is working towards our, towards our purpose. So we, we again, oops. Oops, uh, yeah. So now we got this condition, and we are just copying that over to the, to the uh, next slide in here. Recall that this is still true now, after the while loop. And after the while loop, we, hit, we, we uh, get into this if statement. Now there are two branches, and from the same logic, we got an if statement, and we go to the true branch only when this condition is true. So we copy that over, and we copy this condition over. So we got a P, we got this previous the negation of the while wow condition, and this i uh, less than or equal to n. 
So we, don't, we got this condition. Now, if you analyze the whole thing together, i is greater than or equal to n. Uh, here, i is also greater than or equal to n. And then, uh, so you, it says i is greater than or equal to n. So this must be true, and this must be true. This is true, this is true. This is not necessarily true. So we know that x is not actually within here. So it's not found. Because you can see um, there's this p condition in here. p condition here um, says that i must be less than or equal to n. And this condition here says i must be greater than or equal to n. So less than and equal to n, greater than and equal to n. If you do an n of them, what do you get? This part says i is less than or equal to n. This part says i is greater than or equal to n. I must be equal to n, right? Yes. So my, I must be equal to n. And when i is equal to n, it says that x, x is not within a and, and 0 up to n minus 1. So it must be x is not within here. So we got this condition. And we, we know that, indeed, this means that we cannot find x within this range. So indeed, it's not found. So indeed, it's con consistent. We, we prove that this branch is correct. Similarly, the else branch. Again, copy over p, copy over this negation of the while loop uh, condition, and then negation of this if condition. So negation of that says i must not be greater than or equal to n. So i must be less than or I must be less than n. And here it says, my i must be greater than or equal to n. This one and that one cannot be true at the same time. When this one is true, this one must not be true. And when this one is not true, but the whole thing needs to be true, the only chance that you can make it true is this one must be true. So we prove that in this branch, we actually do find the element of x inside of the array. So that's the, the analysis. Super cumbersome. But that's the way to, to, to ensure that our algorithm is actually correct. And here we're actually analyzing a, a pretty much like five, six lines of code. Imagine a five million lines of code, and you want to prove that it's correct. It's impossible. So there's actually a, 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 a really important research branch just to show, just to study how to show an algorithm is correct. But this is not really uh, our main uh, sort of uh, main, main task of the subject if we are going to show you how to prove an algorithm is correct. We probably, every lecture, we can only do one, one, one algorithm. And, and that's um, not, will not serve. Yes? So can you go to the previous slide? Yeah. Over here, when you assert p after i plus 1, yeah. I don't understand how you can make that assertion. Because after i plus 1, uh, we don't know if a plus i does not equal x. Okay. Right. So we don't know how x is not in 0 and i minus 1. Okay. Right. Now, what's going on in here is that um, if you look at here, um, at here, when p is right, it, when p is correct, right, when you do uh, i plus 1, because here you also have this guarantee which i is less than n. When you do i plus 1, the maximum you can get is just n. So the first branch is still correct. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Now, the next branch says ai is not x. When you do i uh, plus 1, here uh, you haven't really checked this. Uh, if you do i plus 1, what do you got? Uh, you will increase that by 1. The, the thing, though, is here the i also got increased by 1. Make sense? So Because here you got increased by 1. So in this condition, i also got increased by 1. So it still works. Yeah. All good? Anyway, that's the correctness proof. Yes? Right, because we want to know inside each of the place what's going on. And whenever you've got a new condition added to the code, we have to make sure that condition is still correct. So we have to add that in. So, so it's not just a, ma uh, a matter of having the, um, uh, the invariant property. You also need to assert No, exactly. So it's not just this uh, invariant P in here. It's all, all, also about all these conditions that you inject into the code. We make sure that all the conditions are still correct because we want to analyze this once so that we, show, we are sure that these conditions that we added in here together with P in here can guarantee the whole thing in the end will be correct. Uh, and do we have these inserts in, in, in the code? 
No, no. But uh, what the assert here is actually a, a function provided by the uh, C sort of uh, library functions. Uh, you got an assert function that you can use to test whether some condition is true or not. If certain condition has uh, condition has been broken, uh, the assert function will actually terminate your program execution. Oh, so when yeah. you write programs, yeah, you can you can put assert in here. Yeah. Typically, you don't. Uh, only typically, what we assert is we assert when memory allocation has been successful. Later on, we'll talk about memory allocation to pointers. And after memory allocation, we need to make sure that the allocation has been successful. That's the moment where we do assert. Typically, we don't. Yeah. Okay. So that's how we analyze for linear search. And as we just said, uh, in the C library. C program uh, libraries, there's actually this library function called assert, and to use that, you need to include this assert.h, which is a system provided library, and you can do like assert this situation condition. Typically, we don't do it. Usually, we only assert pointer for pointers is not pointing to null, or pointer is not pointing to some really dangerous, dangerous place. Up, so we, we, we see, skip this efficiency for now. We, we look at Look at one more example to talk about the uh, correctness. So we, we do the linear search. Next, next we do the binary search. Uh, so this is the bit of binary search code. Um, you've seen this one. Sh Shannon showed this to you, right? Yeah. OK. So have you written this piece of code yet? If not, why don't you, again, take three minutes to translate this piece of code into your C code? Right? So now. Open your laptop, or even your mobile, if you have a small code editor on your mobile, or, or, or your iPad, trying to translate this piece of code into C code. And then we'll come back to talk about its correctness and, and all that. Right. I'll give you three minutes. Yep, in the form of a function. If you want, you can do a main function as well. I, I just want you to have a sort of a, a closer impression of what's exactly happening within this binary search code. And then when we talk about its correctness, it, it makes it a bit easier to analyze because this one, in terms of ac ac correctness analysis, is super long, <laughs> even though it's, it's not a lot of code. So binary search, coming back. So uh, the actual implementation of binary search um, you can actually go through these slides. Actually, uh, by the way, if you uh, open this set of slides, and if you go to this uh, text that we say some docs and there's a, a red text, and you cl uh, click on it, actually it gives you a, a, a link to this example code. And for the binary search, this example at the end in here, um, this is the binary search implementation. We actually give you a recursive implementation of binary search. Uh, let me show you the, the, the binary search code. Uh, this, this is actually the iterative solution, and there's also a, a recurve, recursive uh, implementation. Um, actually, oh, actually, this is actually the, the sort of recursive implementation. Um, you can do that in the, in the format. Th that's in the pseudo code, it shows you a, a sort of iterative implementation. This is actually a recursive implementation, which would be more natural to talk about. Um, so let's see what, what this binary search uh, how, how does uh, binary search work? So basically what it says is that, all right, uh, given an array, here we, we got another type def, which uh, will make our code a lot more uh, gen generic. If you want to use, uh, use uh, do a binary search on an int array, you, can, you just set this one to an int. If you want to uh, search in a double, you, you set this one to, to a double. So the data t type here is our own type def that allows you to change it to int or double and, and all kinds of different types. So it's got an array. Um, low and high here only means the, the search position, the starting point and end point. Um, actually, the binary search implementation actually is com quite complex. And the reason for that is because whenever you want to calculate, you want to do binary search, you have to find the middle of the telephone book, right? And to find the middle of the telephone book, you take the low, take the high, and, and divide it by two, which is the middle. The issue with this one is, though, when we talk about an array, all the elements, they have an integer index. You cannot have element a number 1.5. It's either element 1 or element 2. But for, for dividing by 2, it could end up with some, somewhere in the middle, element 
and that wouldn't work. Um, here we do an integer division. If you end up with 1.5, you always got one. And because of that, um, this search sometimes can mismatch. And you, you, at some point, you, you could mix the boundary cases. Either you miss the very, very first element or very last element. Because you, you always do, uh, do integer division, the very last element, you might never hit it. Because of that, what we need you to do is that for the low, this is actually low, starting from zero. But for the high, it's not the last element. It's not n minus 1. Instead, we do n. When you do binary search, given n elements for an array, it's not 0 to n minus 1. It's always 0 to n. Actually, this whole analysis is quite cumbersome. Uh, there's actually a, a rumor that says uh, people are actually trying to ask like a, a, some, some thousand or a few hundred sophisticated programmers, ask them to write binary search. Only very few of them get it correct in the first attempt. So it's not as easy. But the general idea is quite easy. Um, take the midpoint and compare the search value. Here we say the search value is search key, and we convert, compare, it, compare it with the midpoint, midpoint value. Here we, we do a pointer array. Uh, this is just a standard operation in, in the C implementation. When you want to do a comparison of two values, we don't com compare their values directly. We take a function call that is designed to just to compare two, two values. And to, for, again, for generalizability, this compare function doesn't take exact values. It takes pointers. And because it takes pointers, we can all the comparison functions, they can all have the same form, which is to take pointers. And when you really need to do the comparison, you can convert them, uh, so dereference them then into actual values and do the comparison. And the definition in here is that if the first value is smaller than the second value, the comparison function will return a negative value. If the first element is the same as the second element, the, the conf, conf function returns a zero. If the first element is greater than the second element, the conf function re returns a positive value. And because of that definition, we don't really need to do a comparison inside the comparison function per se. What we do is that we just do a subtraction of the two values if the first one is smaller than the second one, a subtraction of them must be a negative value, right? So that uh, from the same logic, if the same returns zero, if the first one is greater than the second one, returns a positive number. That's what's happening in this comparison function. Now, uh, so we call the function, we call the function, and we give a pointer pointing to these two values for comparison into a function call. If the return value is a negative value, as we just say, if a negative value means the first one is smaller than the second one meaning that our search key is smaller than the mid value. If it's smaller than the mid value, we reduce the search range from the low up to mid. Make sense? We only now we don't look at the first half. That's, what's, um, that's what this piece of code is showing. This statement in here, um, This if statement in here essentially is just this one. The search key is smaller than the mid value. Less than zero means smaller than the mid value. Then the, the mid search range becomes our new search high. Make sense? Otherwise, otherwise, if the outcome is greater than zero, mean, meaning that the search key is actually greater than mid value, then we throw away the first half and only keep the second half. And to keep the second half, we go from mid to high. Yes? Why we use the compare function? Because we still get three times of compare inventory. Right, very good question. Why do we have to use a compare function? Why don't we just say, uh, if key is less than a mid? Yeah. That works. That's perfectly fine. Or if you want to do less than a uh, less that's perfectly fine, and, and it will work. You don't need any of this. No difference. No difference in efficiency. If anything, this might be a bit faster, because you don't need to do the function call. The only reason why we do this is for generalizability, such that if you want to change to a comparison of two student records, you can't do less than. You have to call some sort of comparison function to take out student records by, for example, compared by their ID, or compared by the, the score of our subject. So for generalizability, we set up this as a template for binary search. But exactly what do you want to compare? And how do you want to compare them? You tell me through a function. 
and I, I give you that function interface, you implement the function body. Make sense? That's, that's the reason why we want to use a comparison function. So this is binary uh, search implementation. So far so good, any questions? All right, great, binary search. And then, uh, why is it correct? Not greater than the end, 
then the only possibility is that it must be equal to the uh, so we found it. If you look at our, our implementation in the code here, oops, uh, that's really weird. So if you look at our implementation in the code in here, th as we emphasized at the beginning, we say high must be n minus uh, high here must be n. It cannot be n minus one. So it has to go actually go beyond one element beyond the end of the array, such that for special cases like you only have one element, then zero plus one still can give you like the first element inside of the array, right? So far so good. Right, so that's the correctness analysis. Now, um, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't unless Shannon insists. If, if that happened, blame Shannon, okay. <laughs> Just joking, yeah. Whatever decision is, it's a joint decision. Right. I, I share the uh, responsibility. <laughs> uh, so that's the correctness analysis. Now, it's also important to show that the loop can also terminate, meaning that now you can show the whole thing is correct. That's all fine. But if you have a loop inside your program and the loop never ends, for example, if you have a code that works perfectly and you can show it, it is correct when the loop ends, you can find the answer. But the issue is, what if the loop never ends? So you still, we can't, we can't design an algorithm like that, right? So we have to also show that if you have a loop, the loop can end. Now how do you show um, the loop can end? In this case, typically uh, when we're talking about loop, usually what the loop does is to go through a certain search space and you're trying to find a solution inside of such space. Now. Uh, to show that a loop can end, what you do is, in every iteration, you show that the search space can shrink. If you ensure that in every iteration, the search space at least shrink by at least one unit of the search space, then we are all good. At some point, we will finish. Right? Even though that one unit could be really, really small, but at, le at least, uh, as long as we can show that the search space will shrink by at least one small unit, we are good. That's the, um, how we show the loop can, can terminate. So what we do is we de design a function. This function will tell how large is the remaining such space. And we need to have a proper variable to tell, tell the such space size. Um, and guarantees that um, 
after after every iteration, this search space can be reduced by at least one. Here it says one, uh, but essentially it means one search space unit. It could be like one student record, could be one integer, could be one, I don't know, uh, a, 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 some sort of subject record, that's fine, but there must be some sort of unit. So in this case, we design our search space. So this apparently is the, our search space size, right? The upper, the upper bound is high, the lower bound is low, and high minus low must be the search space size for our loop. So in each iteration, in each iteration, um, there's only three possibilities in, in each iteration, right? We know um, if, if the element is smaller than the mid, we throw away the second half. If the element is greater than the mid, we throw the first half. So no matter which half we throw, we at least throw one element, right? And that's the reason why after every iteration, the search space must be reduced by at least one. And so we guarantee that this is also correct. Uh, obviously, there's also a third, uh, uh, a third uh, branch which says we actually found the element, then the whole thing is terminate, so the follow must terminate. So that's how I show it. Uh, that's enough about correctness. That's all that I'm going to talk about at correctness. And you can, you, you, you can relieve, right? I can also relieve. <laughs> Next is all about efficiency. This part is a bit more interesting. Um, at the beginning, it could also feel that a bit challenging. But don't worry. Uh, so um, for today's class, we won't get into a, a deep analysis on exactly um, how we show the, the efficiency of a piece of code. Here, we'll just stop at how, what really is the time efficiency for binary search in the sense that if the input size, the search space of the, the um, array got, got increased, how many, how many comparisons we need to do to find, uh, to find whether an element is inside of the array or not. Here, we define a function tn to represent by, so tn here means if you have n numbers, n sorted number in an array, how many comparisons do you need to find whether an element is array or not. To give an example, if you have an array of eight elements, n, meaning that n equals to eight, so tn would be what value? How many comparisons we need? First comparison, throw away half. Half is four, right? So we got four remaining. Second comparison, throw away two. Third comparison, throw away one. That's it. How many comparisons? Three comparisons up to four if you want to confirm the last element is, or is your, your target or not, up to four. Uh, we, can, uh, we can just say three, give it or take. So what, how do we go from A to three? Log base two, eight is three, right? So that's, that's this one. And this actual one here is to confirm the last one, whether it is, it is or not. But how do we go from Tn to here, the sort of, formal equation is actually this one. What it says is, if you want to calculate how many comparisons you need to execute this binary search function, if there's just one element, then you only need one comparison. If you don't have any element at all, obviously at most one, right? So this is the first branch. Now, if you have more than one element in this array you want to execute binary search, how many comparisons you need? You need comparison, you need one comparison to compete, compare the, the mid value, right? And you throw away half. And you still have remaining half, which is n divided by two elements. How many comparisons you need for, to search in uh, n divided by two elements? Well, you need t n divided by two. So we got a recursive um, relationship in here. How do we go from this recursive relationship to this equation? you need a, what we call a master theorem, and that you don't need to do a master, you just need to do another subject. The algorithm analysis subject, it will tell you how to go, to, go from recursive to this uh, equation, but not our subject. Uh, yes? Uh, if you have n equals two, don't you also get tn equals one, with the log base two of two is one? Sorry? If you have n equals two, yeah? um, would tn still be one, because log base two of two would equal one? Uh, if you have two, technically you need to compare twice. Really? If I give you an array of uh, one and x, so I have an array one and x, you tell me is it two inside this array or not? 
How many comparisons? If you use the linear method, you can compare that. Yeah. Yeah, you need a final comparison to, to confirm the last element whether it's a match or not. So that's an additional warning there. Uh, yes? If not, that's enough about um, algorithm currentness. And um, next, we're going to move on to efficiency. And I don't want to keep you sort of wondering what's going on if we just start like, talking about a couple of minutes. So maybe we'll stop at here. And tomorrow, we will do a proper algorithm efficiency analysis. That's all for today. Uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>